1914 was really like a great invention, a great immense furnace. A furnace within which the values, the strategies, the ideologies of those burgeoning socialist parties that had gathered under the roof of the Second International really were to be tested. It was the war, you see, that could test the strategic and the ideological values of those great socialist parties in Europe. Because, you see, when the war came in 1914, in every single belligerent country, with the exception of Serbia and Russia, the socialist parties, which had for years actually been denouncing war and militarism, which had even threatened that if there were any kind of war of capitalist aggression, that there would be an international socialist confrontation with the entire system, that those socialist parties, with the exception of the one in Serbia and Russia, all rallied to the flag that in Germany and in France and in Belgium and in Austria, those socialist parties beat the patriotic drum. They joined governments of sacred union, as they were called, joining with bourgeois parties, and ultimately silenced their own minorities. Those uh, socialists within their own parties who insisted, after all, that the duty of socialists was to make a revolution and not to make war, and that the enemy of the proletariat was capitalism and not some foreign country. What I'm saying is that 1914 would become a tremendous, colossal shock of recognition. That the socialist parties had irretrievably become reformist and electoral. That, as Robert Michels had pointed out and had warned, that those parties would become a haven for bureaucrats, for careerists, for functionaries. That, as Rosa Luxemburg had so co cogently warned, that the very dimension of what it took to mount a movement against monopoly capitalism had never even really been considered by those parties. That those parties, after all, even though they had done very yeoman work in recruiting workers and in spreading the socialist word, really had a tremendous suspicion of mass spontaneity and really had become incompetent by 1914 to mount anything like direct mass action. All of which leads us to a very crucial question. Were there any other strategies? Were there any movements before 1914 that, after all, did not inhabit that universe of electoral politics, that hewed to a different strategic line, that kept asking over and again the questions of how you make a revolution and really how you establish a truly socialist society? And those are important questions, and they lead us in the first instance back again to pre-war France and to that very peculiar, very original working class movement or trade union movement that we call revolutionary syndicalism. And we are really on very original terrain when we talk about revolutionary syndicalism. It is not like any kind of trade unionism that we are accustomed to know and that we are accustomed to consider. The French, the British, and the German trade unions give us no problem. They're very familiar to us. In Great Britain and in Germany, you had large unions. You had bureaucratized unions. You had them very efficient in collective bargaining. Because, after all, those unions were inserted into the system. Those unions had a goal which was very clear and very limited, which was to improve the condition of the workers economically. So that in Germany, for example, the trade unions always operated as a kind of break on the strategy of the Social Democratic Party. And if there was any alternative and any challenge to the reformism of that Social Democratic Party, it never came from the trade unions, but it came from inside the party itself, from its revolutionary Marxist left wing, spearheaded by Rosa Luxemburg. But in France, you see, it was different. The unions were much smaller, much weaker numerically, and much less structured than they were in Great Britain or in Germany. And that those unions did not have a symbiotic relationship with the party. Not like the British trade unions and the Labour Party, for example. Or like the German unions and the Social Democratic Party. Not a symbiotic relationship, but an antagonistic one is the relationship that the French unions had with the party. Expressing their terrific suspicion 
of electoral politics and of parliamentary reformism, their terrific suspicion that they would be placed under the hegemony of a party, that they would be placed under its tutelage, and that consequently their own mission would somehow be halted. Because you see, the goal of these French trade unions, at least as it was expressed and crystallized by the General Confederation of Labor, by the CGT, by the Confédération Générale de Travail, which was the central organism of the French trade union movement, the goal of these trade unions was revolutionary. And the pivotal premise around which these trade unions operated was the competence of syndicalism by itself, or to put it more precisely, the direct economic action of workers culminating in the revolutionary general strike the competence of syndicalism itself to make a revolution and finally to control and organize a new society. And consequently, what you get in this French syndicalist movement is something fundamentally revolutionary, revolutionary in goal, revolutionary in method, very different from anything we are to find in Great Britain or in Germany in other advanced industrial societies. And if you want to come to grips with it, if you really want to understand what this very peculiar formation is, perhaps you ought insert it within a certain tradition, the tradition of working class self-emancipation. By, by that I mean that tradition that says that the workers by themselves, through their own direct mass action, can topple the capitalist system, can make the revolution, and that after that, they can organize and control the new society so that the socialist state is not an authoritarian and centralized state. It's not, for example, a dictatorship over the proletariat, but it is decentralized and self-governing so that the socialist economy is not a bureaucratized managerial economy, but is something that is operates operate at the base, that it, after all is rooted in autogestion or workers' control. That means fundamentally that the base controls the productive system. And that tradition we, we, we root back, after all, to the first international, to that first international which in its founding statutes had proclaimed that the emancipation of the working class will be the work of the workers themselves, and which is a tradition enriched in the Paris Commune, a Paris Commune which, as Marx pointed out, really invented the conception of the socialist state when it smashed the armature and the apparatus of the repressive governmental institutions and when it devolved power among the citizens themselves. A tradition, if you please, and note it well, that will come to its culmination, that will reach its pinnacle in one of the most remarkable experiences in self-government and in direct democracy in all of modern history, namely in the Soviet, in those Soviet that, after all, were to, uh, were to be experienced in 1905 in the Russian Revolution and again in 1917 in the Russian Revolution. And it's in that tradition of working class self-emancipation that you find a certain universe that revolutionary syndicalism really inhabits. And so the question is how it develops in France, how you really get this kind of transformation of trade unionism into that. And it's a very complicated and complex story. But let me suggest three steps to you. First of all, a struggle that takes place between the nascent unions in the end of the 1880s and the beginning of the 1890s against political socialism against the control over those unions by political socialist parties. And that precisely a struggle against the Geddes, the Parti Oublier Francais, that really had its hand on part of that trade union movement. You see, the trade unions in France are not legalized until 1884 by the law of Bandec Rousseau. But within two years, by 1886, those unions had already formed a central organization, 
the National Federation of Syndicates, the Fédération Nationale des Syndicats, a very small organization to be sure, founded in Lyon in 1886, but it was founded mainly by militants out of the Parti Ouvrier Français, by Guedes. And the Guedes really had a control over that organization for the first several years, which meant that its strategy, the outlook of the trade unions, was the one were the ones that these French Marxists imposed. And that outlook was very limited for the unions. What the Guedes always said, being very orthodox Marxists, was that unions were by nature reformists that workers would fight for economic gains, but they wouldn't fight through their unions for a revolution. That the trade unions could never mount an attack upon the state. In other words, could never mount really a revolution. That that was the work of a political party. But that the unions did have a revolutionary function, and that was to recruit workers, to bring them in and assemble them in the unions, to spread the word of socialism, and hence to recruit them for the party. So that the unions were reduced to the role of being kind of recruitment offices for the socialist party, which itself would then be responsible for being architect of the revolution. Now that goes well enough until there are trade unionists who say, is it not our own institutions, it is, is it not our own unions that really can make that revolution? Don't we have the capacity through our strike action, and if we universalize our strike into a general strike, don't we have the capacity by ourselves without depending upon a, foreign upon a foreign political party, really to make that revolution. And that debate becomes intense when the idea, the extravagant idea, the brilliant hope of the Grève Générale, of the general strike, begins to penetrate into trade union circles. And that begins to happen toward the end of the 1880s. And that idea of a general strike, we've already seen among the anarchists of the First International. We've seen it in Bakuni at the end of the 1860s. But in the middle of the 1880s, it is really a disciple of those anarchists. It is an apostle of the general strike in France, who really is the one who spreads the message around. And it is a 30-year-old carpenter, a worker right down to the fingertips, named Joseph Tortelier, who goes around France from 1885 on, preaching the general strike, that it is the instrument by which workers can bring the system down and emancipate themselves. And this Tortelier is looked upon by many labor historians, by Edouard Dolliard, by the Franc, by men who should know the subject, as a very obscure guy who suddenly appeared from nowhere. But the police records are very copious on Tortelier. He was all over the place in the 1880s. He was an anarchist who belonged to little anarchist groups. One of them called, I know in the police records, the Black Panthers of 1886. Another called the League of Anti-Patriots. And this Joseph Tortelier from 1885, obsessed with this idea of the general strike. And one of these guys that really could communicate at working class meetings. There is a description of him left by Paul de la Salle, who was an anarchist, which is marvelous. And he said, you see, this is de la chair. This is of the flesh. This is the kind of guy who, when he talks about the misery of workers and what it is to suffer uh, 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 privation, really feels it and conveys that sensibility. Or when he talks about the general strike, so describes it that it really appears as a vision before people's eyes. And we have an excellent and well-informed police report. This description of what the role of Tortelier was in this entire diffusion of the notion of the Grève Générale, Tortelier has no other goal in his life but to organize the general strike. And he has devoted his every waking moment to it. By the general strike, Tortelier means the following. The immediate and simultaneous work stoppage everywhere. In factories, in mines, in canals, in railroads, telegraph offices, post offices. In a word, everywhere. And that's what he's been preaching for four years all over the country. There's never been a strike 
But that Park Brigade isn't there, trying to escalate it into a general strike. And he had converts, he had them among anarchists like Emile Pouget, the editor of Père Peinard. He had them among socialists like Jean Aleman, and those Alemanis were always disciples of the general strike and closer to syndicalism than other socialists. The point is that by 1890, the idea of the general strike has become a terrific challenge to the Gettist leadership in the trade unions, to the grip that that political party has over the unions. And that challenge really comes to a point of culmination in 1892, because you have a Congress that year in the city of Marseille, which is a Congress of the, Federa the National Federation of Syndicates. And there, a resolution in favor of the general strike as the crucial tactic of the trade union movement is presented. And it is presented by someone who is delegated from the Bourse de Travail in Saint-Nazaire, a young lawyer named Aristide Briand, which shows you where he began. And consequently, it is Briand, <coughs> at that meeting in Marseille in 1892, who put forth this resolution for the general strike, and it is adopted. Now, I tell you that in the audience were Ged and Lafau and even Fiefknecht had come from Germany, and they were appalled by this. And consequently, for the next two years, until the next meeting of the National, uh, of the, uh, National Federation of Syndicates, the Geddes would organize to try to win back control over these unions. And 1893 was a very crucial year, because in that year you have the third Congress of the Second International, the one that is held at Zurich. And when there was a proposition there put for a general strike against war, it was shot down, and the Germans organized opposition to it. And in that same year, 1893, are those legislative elections in which 50 socialists are elected. And the Geddes say, you see, that is the way to power. We must increase those numbers in the parliament, and we must eliminate what Ged was now calling this mirage of the general strike. And so the real showdown would come in 1894 in the city of Nantes, when the Geddes tried to win back this federation of syndicates. And the Geddes met first as a political party in the city of Nantes. In other words, in September of that year, the POF, the Parti Ouvrier Francais, had its own convention there and passed this resolution unanimously. It is only by political action, by the conquest of political power, that organized workers will emancipate themselves only by socializing the means of production. In other words, the Geddes took a strong stand and said it's only a political party that really engineers a political revolution that can change the terms of society, and consequently you know that the debate would be very heated when that National Federation of Syndicates opened its Congress in Nantes only a week after the POF Congress had ended. And there, for the first time, we get the national appearance of Jean-Anne Pelloutier, because it is Pelloutier who now appears at this Congress of Nantes of the National Federation of Syndicates and presents the resolution in favor of the general strike. And that resolution reads, the proletariat now knows that it will never be free except by the total transformation of the present society. Thus, it must prepare itself for the revolutionary general strike, which will topple the establishment. A very fierce debate followed, and that resolution passed by a vote of 65 to 39, which means that the Geddes were defeated, outvoted, and they bolted from the Fédération Nationale des Syndicats, which effectively split it, divided it, and ended its history. Because the next year, 1895, in the city of Limoges, these now revolutionary syndicalists gathered together and founded a new organization called the Confédération Générale de Travail, the General Confederation of Labor, the CGT, which would be the ancestor of the present General Confederation of Labor and would become ultimately the great instrument of revolutionary syndicalism. Now, out of that great struggle, one very important legacy must be noted. And that is that terrific rupture 
between the unions and the parties in France, between syndicalism and socialism, uh, because out of that struggle came a terrific suspicion of tutelage, uh, that somehow the parties wanted to lay hand upon the unions. And that suspicion would, of course, escalate into tremendous hostility, into great antagonism at the time of Millerandism, at the time of ministerial participation. Uh, because at that time, uh, from 1900, let us say, on, uh, when it was perfectly clear that the Socialist Party, or at least part of it, was not only entering a bourgeois ministry, uh, but was trying to make those reforms that would insert a working class into the system, uh, then the syndicalists said, no, no, uh, what they are trying to do is imprison us forever, and that is so deep, you see that even as late as August of 1912, in the syndicalist newspaper, La Bataille Syndicaliste, the syndicalist battle, there is a so-called encyclical printed, an encyclical of revolutionary syndicalism that is signed by all the great names of that movement, Victor Clifwell, Alphonse Merlet, Léon Giraud, and the like, in which encyclical we read the following words of suspicion toward that socialist movement, the history of the CGT has been marked all along by struggle against those who have been anxious to seduce and contain it. A dozen years ago, in 1900, at the time of the Milliron affair, we experienced the depressing corruption of a government encouraged and sustained by a socialist faction which had opportunistically come to support the bourgeois state. And consequently, the workers would go with themselves, through their unions, through their general strike, and without any collaboration with the Socialist Party per se, or any overt collaboration. That, after all, was a central premise of this French revolutionary syndicalism. And so you get its origins, really, in that struggle. And then a second step, and that is the transformation of the Bourse de Travail the transformation of those labor exchanges into what you really have to call a kind of foie, a kind of locus of revolutionary working class culture. The transformation of the Bourse de Travail or the labor exchanges into what is the homeland of a revolutionary working class culture. And I use the word transformation because the Bourse de Travail, you see, these labor exchanges, when they developed in the late 1880s, were really bourgeois institutions, or I should say sponsored by bourgeois municipal councils. Uh, the first one came in Paris in 1887, and the municipal council really subsidized that Bourse de Travail for two very good reasons because they thought it was important to have a job placement center at the, at the time of the Depression, and secondly, a bourse de travail could be overseered by the police. In other words, they could watch the workers, they could pick up their, their mot, they could pick up their words, uh, they could, in a sense, really exercise surveillance in these bourses de travail. But the point is that that bourgeois ploy really backfires. Because by 1892, you already have scores of bourses de travail all over the country that are forums for anarchists, forums for every variety of socialists that have become already, in a sense, working class centers outside of any bourgeois control. And secondly, in 1892, they federate. You get a federation of these bourses de travail, the Fédération Nationale des Bourses de Travail. And the culmination point comes in 1895 because this national federation goes into the hands of Fernand Pelletier. And Pelletier, the most important theorician, the most important practitioner of revolutionary syndicalism in the period of the 1890s. And you see, with Pelletier, you really are into someone very original. Someone dedicated, that's hardly the word. You look at a picture of Pelletier and you can't even imagine how he lasted to the age of 33. Uh, this was a very enlarged head on a very wheezing body. This was somebody tubercular for years. Somebody who would die very young because of this incessant disease. 
But the originality of Pelloutier lies in that tremendous dedication to the working class movement, to the idea that workers should not only assemble together, but that they should understand that they should have a science of their misery, as Pelloutier put it, that they should understand their lives and consequently develop a consciousness of their revolutionary need, of their revolutionary imperative. And this integrity of Pelloutier really was summed up very well by a disciple of his, Pierre Monat, when Monat was asked, what is it that characterizes this Pelloutier? And he said, refuser parvenir, to refuse to succeed. This is a guy who came of bourgeois origins, who came of a family that was Catholic, even royalist in its political opinions, who went to a Catholic seminary, bolted from all of that. Bolted, after all, from Catholicism, from his bourgeois family, and from the entire system of capitalism in France. And so you have that kind of dedication. But what is even more interesting about Pelletier? This is integral in another sense, which is that as much as he had regard for workers, as much as he felt, for example, that workers were perfectly competent to mount a revolution and to control a new society, he never romanticized them that Pelletier was never into categorizing workers, never saying that they were always revolutionary or always reformist, pigeonholing them into a category, but always insisting that they were potential, that they were fatigued, that they could be egoistic, that they could be racist, all of these things Pelletier do, and consequently he said that what they need, after all, is their own educational system, what they need is their own access to self-understanding and self-revelation. This is somebody who understood so very well, Pelletier, that you do not make a revolution simply by changing property titles, that you make a revolution by changing human beings also, who is into the whole idea of a cultural revolution, of a moral revolution, as something that was an ongoing process in the everyday confrontation that he had with the working class. And he puts this all very well in an article that he writes in 1896 called Art and Revolt, La et la Revolt. And he says, and this touches so very much on what the dimension of a revolution is, once we've transferred those property titles, will human beings lose their base passions and their egoism, living by no other standards than love and goodwill? Let's not be stupid. We have to prepare. With the social revolution, we must make a cultural and moral revolution, and we can do that only by living together, but differently than the majority society permits, and that was the function of the Bourse de Travail, because the Bourse de Travail was the working class education. It was, in the first instance, a service of mutual aid. In other words, workers came into the Bourse de Travail beyond any craft, beyond any particular métier. They came in because they were workers, and they got the services of mutual aid. There were funds for unemployment, funds for old age, funds for industrial accidents. In other words, it was the working class succoring the working class, aiding comrades. In the second place, the Bourse de Travail provided the service of a working class university. And this was the most original part of the Pelletier idea. Because what you find there are political lectures, but more than that, you find courses. You find technical courses, you find cultural courses, and then at the very part, you find those libraries. Those magnificent libraries of the Bourse de Travail where workers can come and read. Now, I don't know how, whether you understand how fundamentally important that is. This last year, uh, when I uh, had such a long experience on a commission with workers in France uh, to do something about the writing of working class history, and one of the things that I did with these workers was to go around to a great number of plants where the Comité d'entreprise, in other words, the workers' committee in the plant, really organized and controlled the plant library. In other words, what the union, what the workers built up as their reading material in these plants. And to go to meetings of those workers choosing books, for example, was one of the most magnificent experiences that I have ever had.
because they went so carefully over book lists and they really wanted to question whether they were books that would expand the horizons of workers, whether they would teach them this or that, whether they would be valuable in terms of struggle. And those libraries, consequently, were magnificent. In a place like Guillaume Dubois and so forth, an aircraft factory, where I saw a library that would certainly put to shame certain municipal libraries in, uh, in major cities in America from the point of view of the collections on social problems and on political problems and even on philosophical problems as they touched really those realities that workers have to know about. And consequently, in that sense, the Bulls of Tabai foreshadowed what is a most important function in trade unionism in France now, but certainly was an original Panouquet idea. And these books also provided the service of statistics and documentation, which meant that workers could come and they could find out what the nature of their trade was, what market trends were, what market conditions were. And finally, of course, they were strike centers. And that was the activist part of the Bulls de Travail, because it was there that you could hatch strikes, that groups of workers, for example, could determine how much solidarity they would get, and where they could really begin a collection for a strike bar. And consequently, the point is that these Bulls de Travail began to create what is crucial to revolutionary syndicalism, which are what are called the minorité agissante, the minorité agissante, or the active minorities. In other words, that kind of revolutionary avant-garde, which will really be in the vanguard of this kind of struggle that is being conceived of uh, through the instrument of the general strike. Uh, you see, by the time Panouquet died in 1901, there never were more than about 5% of the French workforce that ever were inscribed in these pools to travail. And consequently, critics have come later and said, well, this was a very tiny minority, and the whole theory of revolutionary syndicalism is built upon an elite, is built upon a tiny minority, whereas the vast mass was a silent youth majority, and consequently, there was a certain kind of romanticism. So is the accusation built into revolutionary syndicalism. But this misses a very fundamental point, and a point that certainly Pelletier and Cliffwell after him understood very well, which is that you cannot set up a sharp dichotomy between those 5% who are the minorité agissante and this so-called silent majority, that among those who were not inscribed in unions, not inscribed in the Bulls de Travail, were many for whom the, uh, the, the message uh, for whom the echo of revolutionary syndicalism was very important. For one reason or another, they may not have been unionized, or they may not have been militant. But the point is that in strike after strike, very small numbers managed to engage in that first decade of the 20th century, managed to engage large numbers who really had nothing to do with those bulls de travail. There was a kind of mass that could be colonized by these revolutionary syndicalists. And in that sense, the transformation of the Bourse de Travail, the creation of the minorité agissante, is another very crucial and important step in the development of this revolutionary syndicalism. And finally, as a third step, the intrusion of the anarchists into the syndicalist movement. And that important for the anarchists, important for syndicalism. Uh, because certainly it meant that the anarchists intruded with their particular libertarian and their particular revolutionary values. Now you see, you have to understand that French anarchism really was rather important. That it was rather important even though you can't measure it numerically. Well, one reason you can never measure anarchism numerically is that there are no organizations against the anarchist thing. And consequently, you don't have membership lists and things of that kind. And consequently, you have heroic historians like Jean Maitland, who has spent his entire life studying French anarchism, and he has to always calculate on the basis of all kinds of fragmentary evidence. But what Maitland tells us is that by about 1890 in France, the anarchist press had a paid circulation of about 5,000. But he estimates, on the basis of very, very careful reconstruction, that those papers were probably read by 100,000. In other words, that anarchism may have had an outreach of about 100,000 in the period around 1890. 
But you see, the problem of the anarchists was that they hewed to a tactical mind from the early 1880s that was called propaganda by the deed, the propaganda by the deed, or propaganda by the deed. Now, propaganda by the deed was summed up as a tactic by the Anarchist Congress of London in 1881 this way. Militants must do everything possible to propagate the revolutionary idea and to catalyze the spirit of revolt in the exploited masses. By operating illegally, they can destroy the illusion of peaceful and legal change. And by choosing their targets carefully, they can dramatize the profound immorality of bourgeois society. Well, you know what this means. It means that the concrete act, the act of terror, the act of violence, the act of dynamite, the act of bomb throwing, will do three things. First of all, it will frighten the bourgeoisie. Secondly, by choosing the target carefully, it will point up a certain very immoral institution or a very immoral kind of uh, relationship in society. And third, it will rouse the spirit of revolt in the workers. And consequently, it shouldn't surprise you that in the anarchist newspapers of the 1880s, there always was a column, generally on the third page, called Les Faudoui Anti-Bourgeois. Well, anti-bourgeois products, those always told you how to make explosives and how to make chemicals and so forth and so on. And then in some of the more sedate anarchist publications, like those of Jean Grave, they would be called études scientifiques, scientific studies. And consequently, those scientific studies likewise almost always had to do with dynamiting and had to do with explosives. Now the thing is that this tactic of propaganda by the deed goes off in three separate directions. It means, in the first place, a certain amount of collective anarchist action in uh, working class communities to try to catalyze mass action. In other words, you choose, let us say, the working class towns like Le Clouseau or Montsoleni. In other words, where there have been strikes and you make a certain number of explosions or a certain number of direct actions in order to try to rouse the mass. Uh, that was done, to give you an illustration, in 1882 by what was called the Ban Mouin, the Black Band, and the Black Gang, or the Black Band, uh, anarchists in 1882, went around generally the mining and industrial towns, bombing an occasional church, bombing an occasional city hall, bombing an occasional school, and so forth, to try to rouse the workers, generally quite unsuccessful. A, a more major tendency, and one that really uh, uh, moves into a sort of a cul-de-sac, but is extremely important in terms of what the transformation of the 1890s really is, is what is called the please individuel, or individual restitution, which is simply individual theft. Uh, because part of the action of propaganda by the deed was individual theft of taking back the ill-got gains of capitalism. Uh, the reasoning being that there could be no profits except through the social production of people who were exploited and who were robbed, and consequently by thieving, uh, you brought back a certain amount of this. Now this was justified, the apologetics, uh, most brilliantly by somebody who was into it very heavily, uh, who was a man named Clément Duval. And Duval makes a testimonial that really is worth reading on that particular subject. Okay, he's a guy who went to jail for a year in 1886 uh, because he had been out thieving. Uh, he himself had been open proletarian. Uh, he'd been unemployed, uh, he was in need, and consequently he began to steal. When he came out of prison, he gave an interview uh, to the newspaper Le Revolte, which was the newspaper of Sebastian Paul, the anarchist paper, and from that interview of the 24th of October of 1886, uh, I call this part of his apologia and of his explanation. Here is why and how I committed that so-called crime. In 1870, like so many others, I didn't question, but in fact respected property and privilege. But I was only 20 then, and since then I've learned better. I've contracted TB. Now this is important. I've contracted TB from bad working conditions. I served as cannon fodder in the army. I became an anarchist with all my heart, having lost that idea of a beautiful and generous world. And I know that the one 
uh, uh, that the one undeniable right that everyone has is the right to survive. So there I was, without work, having to support three children, and so I saw my chance. I stole 80 francs from the till at the railroad station. Now the explanation is very important, because what really the man is talking about is what is stolen every day. All right, if the man suffers tuberculosis, and if he suffers, after all, uh, the, expo the exposure to death in the army, if he suffers this way, and he then restitutes a part of his life by theft, that's his justification, that he takes back what has been taken from him. So he explained in the anarchist newspaper, and went out and stole some more, and having stolen some more, was arrested again. And so we have Duval up before the Cour d'Assises in Paris in January of 1887, and there he wants to make this apologia, make this big explanation, and the court won't permit him to do that, and they sentence him. This time, the theft was 120 francs worth. They sentenced him to life imprisonment at hard labor, and that only after the president had intervened, President Grévy, when the court had suggested the death penalty. And so he was dragged from the court shouting, Viva l'anarchie and Viva la révolution. And he was in prison, not for life, but for 14 years, because in 1901 he escaped and managed to get to the United States. And he lived in the United States until 1935 in Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> and having grown up very close to it, I'm not so sure that he did the right thing in escaping from that prison. But it's nice to say that anyway, he lived the rest of his life surrounded by Italian anarchists who have since published his memoirs, all of them a justification of that propaganda by the act and of the restitution that he tried to make by it. But it's perfectly obvious that this is a cul de sac. And inside the anarchist movement itself, this sort of individual theft was very heavily attacked in the early 1890s. We find John Law, who is a very important anarchist theorician, who is sometimes called the Pope of the Louis Foucault, a very academic kind of anarchist, but writing in his newspaper, La Révolte, in 1891, we are a party of the revolution, and since we are, we can't condone theft, lying, treachery, fraud, which are the very essence of the regime we want to destroy. And that tactic of individual theft really disappeared in the 1890s. But it crested again in the decade before the First World War, but in another form. And there you're talking about a movement in anarchism called illegalism. And that movement really is a movement of open proletariat. You've got to remember that you then have a strong socialist party, you then have a strong general confederation of labor, and there are always people that simply are too much in the margins to integrate themselves into institutions of that kind, and who for one reason or another really are shunted aside. And consequently, from almost the beginning of the 20th century, there comes to be this current of what is called individual libertarianism or illegalism in certain forms, which is so brilliantly described by Victor Serge. Because you see, Serge was into that himself, and in his memoirs, the memoirs of a revolutionary, he talks about what that spirit was for kids like himself who were completely, uh, uh, really décassé at that particular time. And so he says, anarchism swept us away completely because it both demanded everything of us and offered everything to us. There was no remote, there was no remotest corner of life that it failed to illumine. At least it so seemed to us. A man could be a Catholic, a Protestant, a liberal, a radical, a socialist, even a syndicalist, without in any way changing his own life and therefore life in general. It was enough for him, after all, to read the appropriate newspaper, or if he was strict, to frequent the cafe associated with whatever tendency claimed his allegiance. Shot through with contradictions, fragmented into varieties and sub-varieties, anarchism demanded, before anything else, harmony between deeds and words, which in truth is demanded by all forms of idealism, for which they all forget as they become complacent. And so he talks about the fact that he was caught up in something that was the total free life. And there he, became, he came under the influence of Libertà. Individualism had just been affirmed by our hero, Albert Libertà. 
No one knew his real name or anything of him before he started preaching. Crippled in both legs, walking on crutches which he tied vigorously in brawls. He was a great one for brawling despite his handicap. He bore on a powerful body a bearded head whose face was finely proportioned. Destitute, having come as a tramp from the south, he began his preaching in Montmartre among libertarian circles and the pews of poor devils waiting for their dole of soup not far from the site of Sacré-Cœur. Violent, magnetically attractive, he became the heart and soul of a movement of such exceptional dynamism that it is not uh, that it is not entirely dead even at this day. Well, I think Serge exaggerates a little bit about how magnetic the Gaptat was, but it suffices to say that for people that really were outcasts, the idea of living totally free was this great appeal. And so you begin to develop this notion of illegalism, which is really a, a, a theft by bands, uh, which is really armed theft, uh, which is theft by what we would call bands of, of, of robbers. And you get the, the prototype of this, uh, really the great apologist for it and the great hero of it, in a guy named Malius Jacques Paul. And Jacques Paul has been really fascinating because he is, oh, Paul, right at the core of another And everything that he leaves us by way of documentation indicates his utter sincerity with this. This is a guy uh, who had been an apprentice printer. Uh, but had joined uh, an anarchist, uh, a small anarchist group when he was very young and had gotten into a trap. In other words, there had been a police provocateur, a kind of a police agent, uh, who had put a bomb in his hand, thrown it, and he'd gone to prison. And after that, Jacob never really found a proper job. In other words, this is a guy who is really victimized by society because he can never work regularly, because unemployment is his lot. The result is that by about 1900, he forms a band called the Band Jacob, the, the, the Jacob uh, Gang, or the Jacob Band, which over the next five years, between 1900 and 1905, when it was finally caught, committed 106 robberies and took about 6 million francs. Uh, a great deal of which was given back, incidentally, to the anarchist cause. Uh, Jacob himself lived, lived very modestly, as all members of the Jacob band did. And no victim of any of these robberies was ever anyone but what Jacob and his group thought were very rich watchdogs of the society. Uh, they were almost always army officers or judges or bishops. Those were his three favorite targets. And consequently, uh, he moved at those. What was fascinating about the Bang Jacob was a marvelous book on it, incidentally, by a man named Bernard Thomas, a very big book on the Bang Jacob, which is fascinating, because they operated for five years all over France, and they had this incredible network of underground friends. Uh, who simply hid them, uh, who uh, uh, simply deflected the police, and consequently the police could never pick up clues of the of the Bon Jacob uh, until finally they were done in uh, by a traitor somewhere along that line uh, in, in, in that particular network. But finally, Jacob is brought to uh, trial. And the trial is most interesting because he's extremely brilliant in the whole thing. Uh, comes a bishop, for example, uh, to testify against him to say he'd been robbed by the Jacob band, and he has to take the oath uh, to, uh, does he swear to tell the truth and so forth? Jacob shouts and says, well, you always have to ask that of a bishop, whether he really is going to tell the truth. Uh, then comes an army colonel, for example, who lists the things that Jacob stole from his house. He said, you're very imprecise, and then gave a much longer list of things that he stolen and so forth. And finally, Jacob himself gives his particular testimony, uh, and it goes something like this. He says, theft is restitution, the taking back of riches created and stolen. Rather than being imprisoned in a factory, rather than begging on the street for what is my right, I have preferred to be an insurgent, to fight back, to make war on the rich by taking their wealth. Certainly, I realize that you would have preferred that I submit to your laws, that I should be a, a, a cowed and docile worker that I should create your wealth and return for an absurd wage, and that when my body was worn out and my brain paralyzed, that I should starve on some street corner, and then you would call me not a dangerous criminal, but an honest worker. And the priests would assure me a passport to their phony paradise. But no thank you. I prefer to be a criminal conscious of my rights. 
You know, monsieur, that the moral piety about private property, which is so deeply rooted in the masses, is your best policeman. But watch out. The people are getting smarter. Yes, I too would like to live in a society without theft. But how else now to revolt against individual property? Yes, I know that to destroy an effect, we must finally destroy the cause. The struggle will end only when men and women put their work and their wealth in a common fund to belong to all. Well, Jacob was sent off, of course, to life imprisonment and hard labor, but once again he was released after 20 years, that was in 1925, because of ill health. And he managed to live until 1954 when he committed suicide, but he left uh, after, uh, it was found after his death, a set of memoirs which have now been printed uh, called Memories of 50 Years uh, that were uh, apparently written in 1948 and 1949. And what is most interesting is that he reviews uh, the idea of illegalism and finds it really wanting. He says it really isn't the answer uh, in terms of changing the society, and he puts it in these terms. I don't believe that illegalism can liberate human beings in the present society. In fact, if it, brings, uh, if it brings to a few individual freedom from some servitudes, it subjects them to greater ones, to imprisonment, even to execution. The struggle is too unequal. And furthermore, since such acts are so individual, they can't have educational effects as we had hoped they should. So that you get both that second tendency, the third tendency, the most important of what is called propaganda by the deed, and that, quite obviously, the act of terrorism against the political symbol. And that's the thing that we most associate with anarchism. We're talking about the bombing of something that really is to explode the public conscience of the evil of society. And this is justified by the Sebastian Fall, who is really one of the fine anarchist heads of this period. A Sebastian Fall, who is a journalist who runs a newspaper called Le Révolte, the, uh, the, the one in revolt, uh, and who writes this in 1891. Now you see, in 1891, on May Day, there had been an episode in Clichy, which was a suburb of Paris, working class suburb, and there had been three anarchists who had clashed with the police, and they had been picked up, and ultimately were sent to long prison terms for disturbing the peace and for subversion of the state, but they had been very brutally and badly beaten up. And in response to that, Sebastian Paul wrote a brochure called Anarchy in the Courts, uh, which he published in 1891, which really is the justification for this kind of symbolic action. In the present state of society, anarchy can only mean one thing, the negation of the entire authoritarian system. And that means nothing but disobedience and revolt. Why? What is modern society? At the top are priests who traffic in the sacraments, intellectuals who pander their knowledge for money, merchants who cheat their customers, politicians who lie and sell their favors, journalists who conceal the truth and are pre prevented from printing it. At the bottom of society, there are workers without bread, families living in couples, girls of 15 forms of, uh, forced into prostitution. Consider, then, the role of anarchists in this nest of thieves and victims, in the midst of so much corruption and servility. There must be a handful of brave militants who will stand straight and cry out to the exploited, refuse to obey anyone or anything, refuse to command anyone else. So, you may kill us if you want, but our example will be followed and will touch off revolts which will increase until they become a universal revolution. That was the whole rationale, that was the whole raison d'etre of these acts of individual terror that were uh, symbolic acts. And the two names, of course, that really are worth mentioning simply because they were such obscure people and they did this ridiculous thing and why not mention them? I mean, after all, they won't mention Bismarck, why should one mention Anna Scholl? And absolutely, uh, quite obviously, uh, it was an obscure worker, uh, but who symbolized an entire era. Uh, because Baba Shol was like a saint of, this, uh, of these kinds of acts of terror. Uh, it was a guy whose, whose memoir, uh, which he wrote uh, while awaiting trial in prison, Jean Maiton has published, and really shows such a very good head. Uh, somebody who lived such a dismal life, 
uh, who, who was orphaned very early, uh, who found himself constantly without work, uh, who found himself forced to steal and so forth, and finally simply made a crime a way of life. Well, what Rav Ashol finally did was to decide that he had to make the symbolic gesture that really would show where the corruption lay in society. So he threw a bomb in number 136, Boulevard Saint-Germain. Uh, that was a, a house uh, that was inhabited and owned uh, by a man named Ben Wast, who was the judge uh, in the court that had sentenced those three anarchists uh, in the Clichy riots in May Day of 1891. And he did consequently uh, 40,000 francs worth of damage, though nobody was injured. Uh, that was the 11th of March of 1892. Uh, a week later, uh, on the 18th of March, uh, he bombed another house of another judge who likewise had been very repressive. This time he upped the ante and did about 120,000 francs uh, worth of damage. But the only trouble with Rava Scholl was, uh, like many anarchists, uh, he went to anarchist restaurants and talked a lot. And consequently, uh, he, went to, he went to the uh, restaurant May Lee, which is in the Boulevard Magenta, it's very close to where I live. You come to Paris to visit me, I'll show you the restaurant where Rava Scholl blabbed his mouth off. Uh, but it suffices to say he was there, and he was talking about all of this uh, repression in society, and how these two acts had been done, and so forth, and obviously there were police agents there, uh, and he was apprehended, but it took ten men, ten men of the, uh, of the uh, constabulary, actually to put handcuffs on him and to arrest him. Uh, that much of a resistance did he, did he rouse. Uh, finally, uh, in the end of April of 1892, he was sentenced to life imprisonment uh, for these bombings, but uh, he was then brought to trial again in June on a completely uh, a trumped up charge of having been responsible for three murders. He had never murdered, apparently, but these charges were made. And consequently, on the 9th of July of 1892, Rava Scholl was executed, uh, crying, of course, Viva l'anarchie, uh, as he went to his execution. But what is most important about Rava Scholl again in the memoir that he pens is his feeling that this kind of action is not an act gratuit, that it is not something that you do gratuitously, that it has a political content and that it has a political purpose. The same is true of Emile Henri, uh, which ends the era of so-called attentat, uh, the era of outrages uh, between 1892 and 94 of uh, the bomb throwing period. Uh, it reached such a point, incidentally, that a bomb was thrown in the Chamber of Deputies uh, on the 9th of December of 1893. Nobody was injured, actually. And there's very good evidence that August Lyons, who was the anarchist who threw the bomb from the gallery, uh, was actually conned by a police agent because it was discovered that the bomb actually came from the police laboratory. And consequently, uh, you can understand why, because immediately after that bomb was thrown in the Chamber of Deputies, three extremely repressive laws, called the Loi Scalabat, against anarchists and socialists were passed. And consequently, it may very well have been that Auguste Bayon did the police's work uh, on that particular day. But it culminates on the 12th of February of 1894, with a bomb thrown in the Café Terminis uh, in the uh, Gare Saint-Lazare. And that's a young bourgeois, the only bourgeois of the group, a boy named Emile Henri, 21 years old, uh, who had prepared for the Polytechnique, a rather brilliant student, and suddenly into this kind of bomb throwing. And what Emile Henri tells us about his motives really, I suppose, gets to be part of that matter, because he says, I grew up imbued with the morality of this society, and that was my problem. I was taught to respect the flag, the family, authority, and property. But my teachers forgot one thing, that life itself with its injustices and equalities might open my eyes. And that's what happened. I had been told that life, a large life, was open to anyone who had talent and energy. But experience showed me that only cynics and crooks occupied the places at the banquet table. They told me that social institutions were based on justice and equality, and all I saw around me were lies and fraud. Every day, every horrible day, every staggering day, destroyed another illusion. And there's something incredibly sad about that. Uh, this 21-year-old kid 
who literally is driven to these extremities. Well, Anli, of course, is executed. And the era of Akanta comes to an end, and by that time you see Kropotkin, who was really head and shoulders above all of these other anarchist thinkers. Kropotkin was sitting in London already writing articles and saying, look, it isn't this way. You do not change a society with a few pounds of dynamite. You've got to find something else. And at that point, Pelloutier intervenes, writing those articles of 1894 and 5, and saying, the syndicat, the unions, that's where anarchists should go. The union is anti-party. The union is revolutionary. The union is where you find the workers. And consequently, the anarchists should go into the syndicat and consequently find their proper political work there. And so that intrusion really does happen, that infusion of that anarchist esprit. I don't mean to conclude by saying that revolutionary syndicalism is pure anarchism, far from it. Pierre Monat debates with Malatesta on that point in 1907. But there always is an esprit anarchisant, something that says we hate the state, something that says we hate compromise, something that says we suspect political parties, something that says we suspect and we mistrust the bureaucrat. That's in revolutionary syndicalism. And so you get these stages of development. And what it really was, what it stood for ideologically, what it stood for programmatically, fascinating. Let's hold that.